Good morning. Welcome to Pilgrim Church. I'm Doug Johnston, the assistant moderator here at the church. We're grateful to have Reverend Louise Higginbotham provide today's meditation and scripture. And thank you so much for Anna Morrell providing today's music. Uh, one quick announcement, we'll have some cookies and drinks after the service in the, in the fun room right next door. Are there any other announcements that one has? Yes, please. I think my voice was clearing. This is good news. Um, I learned from Rudy that um, her mother-in-law uh, will be attempting a new medication, chemotherapy, which has, has um, great promise. And so rather than it being a hospice visit this week, it has turned around to be a possibility of yet more living. So with no other announcements, we'll begin the service. Thank you. Those who are able and wish to may stand for the call to worship. This is working. Oh Christ, there is no plant in the ground, but it is full of your virtue. There is no life in the sea, there is no creature in the ocean. There is nothing in the heavens, but proclaims your goodness. There is no bird of the wind. There is no star in the sky. There is nothing beneath the sun, but the light your goodness. Amen. And our first hymn is number 292 in the Black Hymnal. <laughs> Together, O oh God, set your blessing on us as we begin this day together. Confirm us in the truth by which we rightly live. Confront us with the truth from which we wrongly turn. We ask not for what we want, but for what you know we need, as we offer this day and ourselves to you. Through Jesus Christ. Amen. And now let us pray as our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, first of all, I want to ask if you can all hear me. Yes. I thank you for the warm welcome um, to Pilgrim Church. Uh, this is, in fact, last month, the 40th anniversary of my ordination. So it's really kind of nice to be able to offer just a brief meditation. As they are saying, I am old and in decline. So you may receive this meditation, I hope, with tender mercy. So let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Before I read the scripture for today, there are several facts which I wish for us to remember. First, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians from prison. Recent scholarship suggests that he is not in Rome under house arrest, but in Ephesus in Turkey, where the prison was known for its lack of food and torturous conditions. Ephesus did not greet Paul with joy. His teaching about the one God known to Jews through the Abrahamic covenant and revealed now through Jesus to the Goyim, to the Gentile pagans, angered just about everybody. This proclamation had in fact caused a citywide riot. And for those details, consult Acts chapter 19. The economic livelihood of Ephesus depended on the silversmiths, and the silversmiths depended on the worship of Artemis, who was enshrined in a great temple, which had been named one of the seven wonders of the world. Tourists abounded, and they came to honor Artemis and to purchase an idol of silver made in her image. And if you go to Ephesus in 2024, you will find tourist gift shops selling just these silver images. Paul and his companions posed a considerable threat, so they threw him in jail. Second important background fact, Nero, is the current emperor of Rome. Known as Caesar, which in Greek is Kyrios, in English, Lord, Paul's message of good news is not so good for imperial Rome. Paul has begun to call this Jesus of Nazareth Lord, that is Kyrios. These followers of the so-called Jewish Messiah are treading on dangerous political ground. The Roman military is sworn to protect the honor of Nero. From other historical writing, we know that Nero was a tyrant who tended to blame misfortune on others. Do not cross Nero or his representatives in the colonies. And the third point to remember is that Paul is lonely and feeling defeated by some recent failures in Corinth. And for those details, consult the second letter to the Corinthians. Paul remembers, however, with great fondness, the church he first established in Philippi, in Macedonia. The church at Philippi 
was a shining example of how Paul had imagined the new communities to live. You can read the whole letter later just to see how often Paul stops to praise and give thanks for these friends who have not forgotten him in his hour of need. So listen now to God's word written by Paul as he encourages his readers to find joy in very hard times. Reading from the New English Bible, chapter four, beginning with the ninth, the fourth verse. I wish you joy in the Lord always. Again, I say, all joy be yours. Be known to everyone for your consideration of others. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious, but in everything, make your requests known to God in prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Then the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, will guard your hearts and your thoughts in Christ Jesus. And now my friends, all that is true, all that is noble, all that is just and pure, all that is lovable and attractive, whatever is excellent and admirable, fill your thoughts with these things. Put into practice the lessons I taught you, the tradition I have passed on, all that you heard me say and saw me do, and the God of peace will be with you. Give thanks for a word of wisdom. Well, I think that Paul may be preaching to himself in this passage. There could not have been much joy in Ephesus in a prison. However, the Christian community at Philippi, which was about 400 miles away by land or by sea, has come to his aid. Paul has not been forgotten. His former congregation has collected a sum of money and other provisions and sent them off with a man named Epaphrodites. Now here's a digression. 1968 years later, through a letter preserved for nearly two millennia, we know the name of the delivery man on the Ephesus route. This is why I love close scriptural study. I can feel an enchanted connection to the far past. In this charming detail, and in the whole of Paul's brilliant exhortation, he certainly spoke to my condition these last few weeks. I suspect that Paul may be speaking to many of us. July has been exceptionally hot in Lexington. I will repeat, it has been hot. <laughs> so hot that we felt imprisoned in air-conditioned rooms, exiled from familiar walks and the care of gardens. Not a good feeling. More seriously, events in our nation and throughout the world have seemed relentlessly grim. The attempted assassination of former President Trump has left us stunned. It has unfortunately only exacerbated our national divisions. Now add to this the litany of people and places that are suffering climate disasters and war and armed conflict and starvation and displacement and moral anguish. It is almost too much to bear. Sometimes it feels like we are imprisoned by the news. We hear, see, and read. How many of us have avoided watching the television news? 
I know that I have. There is an empty space in my life where in the past I was engaged daily in the news. I hope you can see where this is going. Paul's exhortation to the fledgling and frightened communities of faith in the ancient Mediterranean provides a guide for people of faith like us who are beleaguered, imprisoned even, by hard times and bad news. Esther Duval, in a glorious little book that was lent to me, so I don't have it with me, entitled The White Stone, writes that, and I quote, thankfulness ought to be easy for the privileged, but it is not. We would do well to remember the words of the poet W.H. Auden, who speaks of our need to practice the scales of rejoicing. Paul puts it this way, be known to everyone for your consideration of others. Do not be anxious. Make your needs known to God with thanksgiving every day every day, like playing the scales, do, re, mi. Even though imprisoned and expecting death, Paul offers this teaching. Fill your thoughts with what is good, with all that is true, all that is noble, all that is just and pure, all that is lovable and attractive, whatever is excellent and admirable, put into practice the lessons I taught you every day, every day, the scales of rejoicing and, God, and the God of peace will be with you. Now this is good theology and as it turns out, a bit like 21st century cognitive behavioral therapy, find ways to offset the cacophony of hate which floods our lives. So I'm going to offer you some ways I have tried to beat the heat of the weather and of political frenzy this month. First, the new Lexington Women's Monument meets all of Paul's criteria. On September 1st, Pilgrim Church will gather there to enjoy a tour led by Martha Wood and a picnic on the green. But by way of preparation, let me describe those things which a newcomer like myself to Lexington found joyful. The bees the rabbits, the sunflowers, the carefully sculpted face and hands of Margaret Tulip, a freedom fighter, Anne Harrington, patriot at her subversive spinning wheel, the 21st century woman who persists, all combined with so many more historical references to form a lovely, inviting, yet powerful sculpture that bids the viewer to enter this elegant space and stay a while. And they even included some benches, so you can. And then for me, there is music, new music songs and melodies that bring together the best of jazz, Chopin and Beethoven, rhythm and blues with electric sound. Now I would ask you to close your eyes if you're comfortable and imagine yourself on the great lawn at Tanglewood. It's a perfect evening, clear sky, no heat, Family and friends together. A young man from New Orleans is introducing this privileged crowd to music that breaks down walls and overcomes racial and class divisions. 
music that brings everyone together. So let's take a moment to listen to this lullaby and take joy to the people of Philippi, the peace of God, which is beyond all understanding, will keep our hearts and our thoughts in Christ Jesus. Amen. We will uh, play the song at the end of the service. I'll figure it out. So it was just unable to do it through Zoom. <laughs> So I would just ask, are there any prayer requests this morning? Any celebrations or areas of concern? Mm. All right, let us be in a spirit of pray, prayer. God be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we ask that your presence be known to all in these turbulent and troubled times. Help us to remember that love and acceptance should be our guiding words. You who taught us to love one another, please walk with us on our path with a gentle hand upon our shoulder. Let the children in war zones around the world feel your embrace. Help our country acknowledge community across political divides. Be with John, Rebe, and Zach as John's mother, Dorit, tries a new treatment. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. We'll now accept this morning's offering with a musical accompaniment. All good gifts around us come from you, O God. You have given us life and new life in Christ. As you have given us gifts, so we offer our gifts that we may have gifts, so that we may be gifts to one another, even as Jesus so taught and lived. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 476.
Thank you again to, <laughs> yes, I know, <laughs> to, to Reverend Louise and to Anna. And please join me in the benediction. The blessing of the God of life be ours. The blessing of the loving Christ be ours. The blessing of the Holy Spirit be ours. To cherish us, to help us, to make us holy. <laughs>